I did try to unionize um, my workplace. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So the base salary when I started for like people in my position, like sales reps in the company was only $30,000. Oh my had, goodness. That's less than had, 15 bucks an hour. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. I think maybe it's like a little bit over 15 bucks. It's in that same ballpark. And it apparently had been that way for, for decades. Hey, fellow workers, my name is Kim Siever. Welcome back to the Alberta Worker Podcast. This is episode one of season two, and I would like to acknowledge that we are broadcasting from the territory of the Nitsitapi. Our guest for the first episode of our second season is Juan Estevez, who is a terminally online socialist cat dad. We are very happy to welcome you on board, Juan. Thank you for joining the Alberta Worker Podcast. Thanks for having me, Kim. I'm currently uh, in Calgary on Treaty 7 territory. And yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, great. So why don't we just get straight into it? So Juan, the bulk of this podcast is just going to be you talking about your life story, like where you grew up, what your family life was like, the education you might have received. And then of course, also talk about your personal labor history. You can intersperse that with your life story, or you can put it on to talk about it separately at the end. It's totally up to you. And then I'll just come in and out and ask questions as, as the case may be. So floor is all yours. I was born in Colombia in the capital city of Bogota, but most of my time spent in Colombia was in a small farm uh, outside of Cali because my dad in Colombia, he was like, a, he managed a bunch of like different like farms uh, throughout the country. Like on the farm that we lived on was, it was like a tilapia fish farm. There was also like cows and all the other stuff. And then we left Colombia and moved to the United States when I was four. We kind of bounced around a little bit before because um, he has like family in the United States. So we bounced around, but then we ended up uh, living in Florida for about three years. And my dad had a, also was able to set up a tilapia fish farm of his own there. But then there was like immigration issues with like getting papers like renewed and everything. And he had friends that lived in London, Ontario. So he decided to to go there. Uh, London, Ontario has like a very large Colombian population. So kind of made sense to go there. And he said like everyone he knew, like their experience, like the Canadian immigration system was a bit easier than the American system. So we went there. We spent, uh, I think it was like three, four years in London and like this uh, surrounding area, the bulk of it was spent on a on like a farm just outside of London, Ontario, in a community in, in the county of Arva. Actually, I think, I think it's called Middlesex County. And my dad, you know, he struggled to find uh, full time work while he was while we lived there. A lot of his like work experience was like in agriculture, um, because he like in you know in Colombia he like worked on fish farms and some coffee production. Like his previous work, he lived and worked in I Israel for a bit, um, doing irrigation of citrus fruits. But he wasn't really able to get a good full-time position that paid well in London, Ontario. Well, a lot of the like, workplaces in, uh, in Canada in general kind of really dismissed his, um, his work, his past like, work experiences and expertise because it wasn't Canadian. Right. And so he kind of, he worked a lot in like feed lots and he kind of did a lot. At one point he worked at a, I forget what they're called, a seed production factory. <laughs> I forget the name of the plant that he worked at. This is um, still Ontario? No. So it's like a, gra a granary. He worked at a granary. That's okay. that's the word. You're not in Ontario at this point anymore? No, no. Okay. No, we no, we only lived there for like three to four years and he struggled to find like full-time work. So he started looking elsewhere. He did like a few trips out to Alberta. Like he would come over like on temporary contracts. We would, we would, we stayed in Ontario. He stayed in Edmonton for a bit. Um, he didn't really like the job or the city that much. Um, it's because probably because he was there during the winter, um, <laughs> until eventually he, um, got a job at a company in Noble Ford, um, oh, okay. as a heavy duty mechanic, you know, he came over for a few months. He kind of liked it. He liked Lethbridge. It's like kind of close to Calgary. It's close to the mountains. It was affordable. Weather's better in this winter time. The wind is, you know, <laughs> that's what makes it better. <laughs> the weather better in the winter time. <laughs> Yeah, so we moved to Lethbridge and I think it was like 2007, because yeah, I was in grade seven. And then, yeah, I went to school at, uh, what's it called? St. Francis. Yeah, I went through like the, the Catholic school system. Okay. Um, Even though like my parents aren't really religious, like my mom is like Catholic, but she doesn't really like 
mention it often um or was like a, it's not a big part of her life uh, and my dad is like a religious he doesn't really care i mean my sister went through the catholic school system there in lethbridge at st francis and then cch after i graduated you Dob graduated the, from cch yeah i graduated from cch okay uh in 2013 and while i was going through um like high school i had two main jobs um i worked at zellers i got my first that was like i think my first real job that wasn't like paper route my first job was to like assemble their bikes um and then eventually that transitioned into like a, a stockroom role i don't understand the hype for zellers and that's probably because i worked there like i know a lot of people like nostalgic <laughs> for zellers i i don't understand it i think it was a terrible place their food was like pretty mediocre um <laughs> yeah but i mean most diner food's pretty mediocre it's diner yeah food. I worked there right until they closed. So I got to go through the whole liquidation process. And you then... worked at the Lethbridge one right up until they closed? Yeah. Okay. I didn't like really care that it closed because it was the shitty minimum wage job. Oh, so are, am I allowed to swear? As an anarchist, I believe in freedom of speech. Okay, cool. So yeah, it was like some like shitty minimum wage job. So like it didn't really like, bug me. Obviously, it kind of sucked for like the, the people that that worked there longer, but I was still in high school. So then kind of like fully understand like the ramifications. I was kind of more self-centered. I was more interested in just having extra spending money. And then in the summers when I had more time, I would work at the same place as my dad, kind of like helping him out. I was officially like a laborer, but I was basically doing regular to like heavy duty mechanics stuff with him. It was pretty physical labor. Um, and then and he's still in Noblefer at that feedlot. No, so at this point it was um at a company in Lethbridge called LA Power. Okay. Um so yeah, he was a heavy duty mechanic there for for a few years. That was probably like the best job he had in Lethbridge, like in terms of pay and like hours and everything. Uh cuz he was kind of in charge. The owner kind of like just put him in charge of like all like the maintenance of like the fleet vehicles and everything. It was still not a, a great job just cuz like the 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 job is like very grueling. My dad like suffers from like a lot of like chronic injuries and pain now and there wasn't really benefits even though like it paid decently like as like an hourly wage there's no real like health benefits and he really like never like took care of his health either because it was focused on just like working as much as possible to like help make ends meet and my mom growing up she like she would work part-time so she could like kind of take care of us but also kind of help make ends meet she originally worked at dollarama and then she worked at sears uh, up until it closed there in lethbridge and I, i'm like, sensing a, a a theme among your family members yeah if we work somewhere that's gonna go into it's gonna close man <laughs> yeah and then after sears closed she um got a job at shoppers before she started she started a food truck oh really um like they don't live in lethbridge anymore but it was a, a churro food truck okay um, cool she kind of decided to um, she like worked some like a uh, Latin Fest events in Lethbridge selling churros and those went really well. And so, and this is probably to... the time when like everybody and their brother had a food truck. In so this was, they were there, they were the ones starting the trends. Like they were, they were okay. right at the, at the beginning of like yeah. the, they're one of like the earlier food trucks in Lethbridge. So that's kind of our life in Lethbridge. I graduated from CCH um, and then I went to university at, U at UofL. They have like a double major in new media and marketing uh, or just management program there because I originally was very interested in like in film and I wanted to go into like the film industry. I like applied to like Vancouver Film School and the Art Institute of Vancouver. I got accepted to both, but uh, my parents couldn't afford to, to let me to go there. And so it was just kind of like a, a compromise do it, but then stay close to home. And I eventually switched out of the new media program because it was very graphic design oriented and graphic design isn't something I'm interested in or I'm very good at anyways. So I switched into marketing and finance, but I kept like the new media minor and just took their like films, all their film courses. I originally thought marketing because I don't know, I thought it'd be fun. But then I realized that marketing degree is just all fluff and there's like nothing useful people make fun of like you know like history and philosophy degrees for being fluff and useless a marketing degree is much more fluff and useless than anything <laughs> you could ever imagine uh you don't really learn you truly like you don't i don't think i learned anything valuable in those in those courses maybe like a few things like here and there but i, I could have like learned that online and then the finance degree like there was some interesting stuff about it trading stocks and stuff like that and i thought i could get rich and make money went through the program i kind of i started like really like learning more of a, like our capitalist system and just like how terrible it is um even in like class discussions 
it's just like all about the the bottom line profit dollars for them um didn't care about anything sure else along the way and at the time like the ndp had come into power and like the carbon tax was like often like a, a class discussion you know i like supported like the concept of like the what the ndp was doing with the carbon tax and so i was always like pro carbon tax and they were like oh no this is bad this is government overreach even though like they would acknowledge that like climate change yeah it's real but this doesn't solve anything but they also offered like no like alternatives to it all of them were trump supporters because this was also like at that time you know they thought he was crazy but all they cared about was the economy like they thought he was the best for the economy they didn't care about rights or or any of that stuff uh like a no, bottom no, line social issues. yeah bottom line just wanted to make money they were all anti-union from like a knowledge standpoint that was kind of like a, a radicalizing process uh for me i don't think that was like necessarily put me like into like the socialist camp but it definitely like turned me away from like more like right-wing stuff because going into university for some reason i was like oh yeah libertarianism <laughs> <laughs> but and not the real but libertarianism still, you're thinking american libertarianism yeah i was always like pro like abortion rights pro like gay marriage pro like left-wing social issues but it was always like fuck taxes um <laughs> um government can't tell me what to do i should be able to do what i want but like pro rights and then kind of like throughout university i kind of like understand like began to understand like the like the conflict between those two socially liberal and like economically conservative like, like i kind of began to understand how like those like ideologies conflict and they can't really reconcile with each other right. and so i i'd say like i definitely like shifted more into like the center kind of more of like a like a liberal maybe like social democrat by like the time i graduated because you know i kind of believe that like there's a way of like making this work within the system there's like there's a path forward to like improving the world and making it better and then after I graduated, I moved to Montreal because uh, my partner got into McGill to go do their mas her master's there uh, okay. in neuroscience. I was a little uh, hesitant on doing that that jump across the country just because I wasn't sure, like, would I be able to get a job in Montreal? Like, would I be able to, like, properly integrate? Like, I didn't really know any French, even though I speak Spanish. Um, right. I have this, like superiority like of languages of like the romantic languages like i know spanish it's the best one i don't need to know french <laughs> <laughs> oh i see okay when i moved to to montreal um i couldn't get a job in finance because almost everything was like client facing and if you want something client face like client facing you got to know some french i ended up getting the sales job that i have right now because it sells to it's, it's like an it sales job so i sell it to uh, american businesses so it's business to business sales so it was all english no french required the pay was okay but like the health benefits are really good and so it was kind of like a okay i can do this while i learn french uh because like we would know how long we were going to be in montreal like two to four years and then after that i should be able to actually like get into like a finance career unfortunately that didn't happen because of the pandemic <laughs> We moved there in um in 2018, like in September 2018. So I started taking like the the French courses uh, through the YMCA because there was like a big backlog through the the free government offered French courses, which is kind of funny because they're like so insistent on that everyone has to learn French that that's not funding the French program enough. So I had to just pay out of pocket, right, for it. Yeah. And so, you know, I was like kind of progressing along and I was also studying for my CFA, which is chartered financial analyst. Um, it's like a certificate, kind of like the, like an equivalent certification for like finance as like accountants, like accountants do a CPA finance does CFA. I took a course to kind of study up for that. And I was scheduled to write my level one exam. It was either May or June of 2020. And as we all know, the the world kind of stopped in March of that year. My like exam was like rescheduled indefinitely. Uh, no one knew when we were going to be able to write. And it was very difficult to like keep studying because you like cramp for like a short period of time to like know everything. So then you can just like dump it out on the exam. I didn't end up writing it until like July of 2021. Oh my goodness. And so just going over like all this finance stuff over and over and over again was just absurd like my brain i just like all it did was like condition me to like really hate finance uh, which is 
which I was never like a big fan of. Like there was like some stuff that was like kind of interesting. Now it's all nothing. Like I'm not interested in it in any way. So that kind of it literally killed like any interest I had in like pursuing that career. So I'm still like in the same sales job because I've been kind of like moderately successful at it and it's been like it's paid well enough and ever since COVID happened it's been remote I, I enjoy like not having to commute like when I lived in Montreal like the public transit was great but it was still like a 30 40 minute commute every day and so I just kind of felt like I was like wasting like almost like two hours of my life every single day um, totally it was like that when I lived in Vancouver same thing like there have been other opportunities but they involve commuting that have come up and that's just, it's really hard for me to like accept it to, to commute again. Oh, so you're one of those work from home people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I've been working from home for three years and I want to keep it going for as long as possible. I mean, I've been doing it for 10. So before the pandemic started, I did try to unionize um, my workplace. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So the base salary when I started for like, people in my position like sales reps in the company was only thirty thousand dollars oh my had, goodness that's less than had, 15 bucks an hour yeah um, oh wow i think maybe it's like a little bit over 15 bucks it's in that same ballpark and it apparently had been that way for for decades like there are people there for like 15 plus years who started at 30k and were still at 30k but they didn't really kind of care because the commission kind of made up for it right. but if you were like starting out it was it was kind of rough living off that after like I kind of found out like the salary structure I was was thinking of ways of like well how do we increase the base salary because like commission isn't guaranteed money and it's like important to have like the guaranteed money in my opinion like like that's what you that's what you can rely on every month absolutely um, to, to pay for everything um and it's a billion dollar company there's no reason they can't pay us more money um they report massive profits every quarter <laughs> sure and so I started kind of thinking of ways of like how could that happen I did like researching. It turns out Quebec has like the most union friendly legislation in the entire continent because all you need is 50% plus one of uh, members to like sign the union card. Right. And I think it was like that in Alberta too until the UCP got in. No, uh, it was actually different. Uh, the NDP set the threshold at 65, oh, which okay. was like extremely disappointing. Like labor leaders were like extremely disappointed when the NDP right. didn't make it 50 or 55 because the NDP in BC made it 55%, but Quebec is even better at just 50% plus one. Okay, that's awesome. And that's automatic. Would you just get 50% plus one and then you automatically qualify yeah. for union? Yeah, you don't have to do like a vote. If you get like 35% of people to sign, then you can go through the voting process. Okay. Um, but when I talked to the to like the UFCW rep that I reached out to, they prefer to just do the 50% plus one because then that's just... There's no right. lobbying. It doesn't give the organizations like time to like union bust. Yeah. So totally. if you can like secretly do it, get those signatures, then you're golden. So the office employed over 300 people. Like there were like over 300 people looking, working at our office and our office was like divided in two. So like it was two floors. Like there was like a reps that sold that worked selling like into like the United States market and the top floor reps sold in, like in the Canadian market. And so like we didn't really interact with like the people on the top floor there wasn't like a lot of like intermingling so i didn't really know about people that like worked in the upstairs part but i still like tried to like get like people that i knew involved i did get like a handful of people to like sign the card the people i got like were all like the same tenured as me we like came in like at the same time and we were like friends you know we like went out after work all the time we talked when i started kind of trying to get more tenured reps on board they were extremely hesitant they didn't really want to get involved. They didn't want to sign something. One of them told me that someone previously had tried and the organization found out and the union busted. Yeah. If you're tenured in the organization, it's because like you've been a successful rep. So you're, you know, you're making like six figures plus. Right. The need for a union for like specifically like to increase your pay wasn't as important to them because they were they were making decent money and so they didn't really like, feel like the, they didn't really see like a need of doing it it was really difficult getting like the more experienced reps on board but then the the pandemic happened uh we all were in remote and then we i never really got to see other people in person again and so i didn't really have a way of like trying to organize with them anymore right um because i can't like exactly like send out an, e an email 
within like the the company or message people on teams saying hey do you want to unionize that's because the company has the ability to like monitor all that and you want to do it like secretly so they don't catch a wind of it that was kind of where it, it kind of died there that's the effort yeah yeah it was really unfortunate like the pandemic gave us like the work from home stuff but it kind of took away the ability to organize kind of like one of the downsides of of working from home like yeah it was like the convenience of not having to commute being able to have a more like relaxed life work-life balance but you don't really have like a, a way of like connecting with people and and organizing in that way they did eventually increase like the base salary throughout the company like they implemented like a tiered structure um, depending on like your on your sales uh, because they acquired another company who had all their reps had like higher base salaries and so they had to like find a way to reconcile that somehow right um but unfortunately it didn't come from, from unionization yeah yeah but they felt like they had to like their hands were tied they were forced to do it yeah, because they like the other companies like contracts were were like just better. But they're funny enough. They're like the other company that they acquired is like their work culture was worse based off from what I've heard from people. So oh, the really? pay was the pay was a bit better, but the work culture was like very boiler room. Uh, um, my company kind of seemed to to try to keep the wage low, but like have a better like work culture and better benefits. And like our company didn't have like. Uh, had like a relaxed stress code and the like the health benefits granted are like i will admit are, are pretty amazing like i'm like 100 percent covered for like everything that's awesome so yeah that's just kind of where it ended and then we moved back to we moved back to alberta we chose to move to calgary after my partner finished her uh her master's she tried to get into med school um wasn't it's kind of like a work in progress but the but she works for ahs right now as a research coordinator uh, my parents moved from they like left left bridge and they moved to to nova scotia because they were tired of um albertan winters um <laughs> they wanted something kind of more mild and they kind of like semi-retired because now all they do is run their food truck out in um they like live in like the yarmouth area like uh, just like the southern part of like um, of Nova Scotia, and so yeah. they just kind of bought an acreage there. And and my sister also works in Hal. Like she she moved to Halifax first because she wanted to get out of Alberta. BC was too expensive. Uh, Toronto was too expensive. She wasn't interested in Montreal, even though I like I tried to convince her to go to Montreal. And so Halifax kind of seemed like the best option for her. And she works out there as um at one of like the Halifax shelters. She's like a, a supervisor. Okay, cool. And the food truck your parents are running, is that still a churro food truck? Yeah. Yeah. They moved, they moved with their, like they took the food truck with them. Okay. Cool. Awesome. And so you are where you are now. The Alberta Worker Podcast is a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Here's a jingle from another member of the network. Hello, I'm Dave Lehigh, host of the podcast show, the IAM 141 Report. You can find the show on the Anchor Network or Spotify. The 141 Report is part of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. You can find over 80 channels of union-related specific programs. Here you can learn more about unions and the labor movement. Be sure to visit us at laborradionetwork.org or hashtag laborradiopod. Once again, that's hashtag laborradiopod. And now, back to the show. You're listening to the Alberta Worker Podcast. When I moved back to Alberta, um, moved to Calgary, I was kind of interested in in getting into into politics because I just kind of wanted to to try and create a better world moving forward. Because there was, I mean, the pandemic clearly showed that there were a lot of things wrong. Kind of like really like exposed and put things into like a microscope and magnified everything that was worse than before. I wanted to like get involved somehow, and and politics kind of seemed like an opportunity to do that, especially because there was like a an a looming election in 2021 so i got involved with the ndp because because at that point that was the most left-leaning party there was even though like they're not really a left-wing party but that was as close as you can get to one and they were doing decently in the like kind of in the polls drug meat kind of seemed like a charismatic leader and it you know it gave like the illusion of maybe they had a chance of of forming at least like a, a minority government or at least putting like a, a big dent in things their their platform wasn't bad the big thing i really like supported and liked about it was like their the universal health care 
like making your healthcare truly universal, you know, including pharma care, dental care, envision care, mental health care, and, you know, catching us up to, to the rest of the Western world with, with universal healthcare. I mean, yeah, when you compare Canada to the United States, like our healthcare system might seem better, but when you compare it to Europe, it kind of really shows the flaws of like how little is actually covered here. Um, right. And even compared to, to other places, like even in South America, like when I was in Argentina one summer, they, they have like actual universal healthcare too. And it's for everyone. Like I was a tourist there. I, I got really sick and had to go to a hospital. I didn't have to pay for anything. Um, wow. Except for like over the counter drugs, like an Advil or whatever. I had to take the, to feel better later. It kind of really like shows that like Canada is it's just like really far behind but because we compare ourselves to the united states we seem godly absolutely uh, and so yeah i i decided to get involved in them just because you know if you control power and politics then you should be able to affect change right um unfortunately i mean i shouldn't be surprised especially because i kind of had the vibes going in that the ndp didn't care about their Alberta writings. <laughs> yeah, I know um, all about that. Like at least the federal part, like, you know, obviously the, the federal right. party, um, they've got their one, they've got the one, the one writing at Edmonton and now they have two, but yeah, like the, the, the constituency association for, for Calgary center was basically non-existent. Their treasurer was desperately trying to get new people to join in so they can dump the responsibilities onto someone else. Um, <laughs> But they didn't, you know, they didn't have a candidate. And so I kind of figured, you know, well, at least I can get the candidate role easy. And, you know, Calgary Center is a, an urban riding. There's no reason I shouldn't be able to do something here. Like I should be able to to make some progress, build up the, the constituency association and everything. I got the nomination, but I felt completely alone the entire time. That sucks. Um, yeah. Like there were like two, three other people in this, in the consistency association that kind of joined at the same time as me. And, you know, like they kind of wanted to be involved, but I think they also got the the impression that the party doesn't care. And so if the party's not going to put an effort in, why should they put an effort in? Right. Um, like I ran the campaign as best as I could with, I, th I think I spent like $5,000 in total. But that was like money that had like trickled in over like the past like few years. So, Cause like some people just have kind of like automatic donations coming in. And then my parents yeah. gave me a donation as well to direct it to my campaign. I couldn't door knock in downtown because it, it was during COVID. Um, right. like the party didn't want door knocking indoors. Yeah. So I kind of uh, stuck more to like the suburban parts of Calgary Center. Something that like really shocked me and surprised me that I didn't like expect was like the divide between the, the provincial NDP supporters and the federal NDP supporters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just because you know, you, like you like go up to to houses with like pride flags or the save education or health care or save our parks signs and you're like oh these people should be at least friendly and receptive to to hearing my message and at the very least should be like not rude you know they should be like easy door knocks so many of them were not nice really? i remember yeah i remember going up to a house near the beginning of the campaign when i needed to get like signatures to get my name on the ballot i went up right. to to a house with a pride flag and i was like okay th this should this should be like why wouldn't they sign this like they didn't want to sign because they didn't want my name on the ballot because they didn't want to split the vote because they're going to vote liberal and they support the alberta ndp but don't support the federal ndp yeah i i that's that's been my impression that a lot of the people who vote for alberta ndp vote for federal liberals i honestly didn't expect it to be like that at all because you know the, the alberta ndp brand is strong you know i'd figure that like you know there might be some overlap but they should be at least receptive to to my message, but they they kind of weren't, which was very unfortunate. Like I feel I felt like um conservative leaning voters were more um, receptive or at least like like had better manners with me at the door. Um, right. Uh, versus versus like liberal supporters, which is <laughs> which was so weird and like eye opening to me. Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, so you know, ran the that ran the campaign with with little to no support from the from the party came third kind of as you know expected conservatives won i did have like the best ndp performance in that writing since i think it was like 88 87 that's awesome um, yeah so there was there was that positive i mean i don't know how much of that was me and how much was it like the the party's marketing 
sure. obviously, but I mean, it's something, <laughs> I guess it's best third place finish. <laughs> you, you, you must have had something to do with it. Like during the election, obviously it was kind of like disillusioned by the, by the party's lack of support, but especially after, through the election happened uh, and the, the party just kind of seemed weak like they didn't especially with the coastal pipeline being built bcndp trespassing on indigenous uh, sovereignty and sending like rcmp officers and just the way that the federal ndp didn't want to comment on that in any way they just kind of avoided the issue jagmeet really he doesn't care about you know having the correct stances he's just there to try to win and collect the paycheck basically you know during the during the campaign we were told like this was like a general message to like everyone but it was mostly directed towards like the bc candidates of like not trying to to be combative or argumentative against um the bc ndp uh, oh really in government at the time yeah they wanted to to get their support get their vote like the the vote of bc ndp voters and so it was like a try to avoid talking about the old growth old growth force in bc oh my goodness and, and stuff like that they were like bring this up after the election sure but let's during the election let's try to be a big tent and it, like i understand the, i understand the the strategy there but at the same time like how can you campaign one way like just claiming you support the environment and indigenous people and then not be willing to criticize things like that you know yeah absolutely it's all about power and rather than like what's best for everybody yeah and then i like a lot of other NDP supporters and candidates felt like very betrayed by the uh, supply and confidence uh, agreement that they yeah. signed with like the federal liberals to keep them in power. Of course. Um, and you know, like the like Jagmeet is passing it off as like the biggest investment in healthcare since the formation of Medicare, which technically I guess might be true, but at the same time, like our healthcare system is being like slowly privatized at the provincial level, and your accomplishment is that you've brought means tested dental care to, to children and no one else yeah and even then it's only a certain group of children like if their parents already have private health care they don't qualify it was wild because i wouldn't have qualified for that dental care even though i didn't have dental care growing up because um my dad he didn't have like health benefits through work but um because he worked 50 60 hours a week like and plus my mom's like part-time income that would have put us probably closer over that threshold and yeah. so we still wouldn't have gotten benefits even though we yeah. didn't have anything our family right now is under ninety thousand, but we have private health care service that we pay out of pocket for because there isn't sufficient health care coverage in the province so <laughs> it's it's like this catch-22 right where they're probably this this top up for at least for children but you have to have no health care but we have health care because there's no health care it's like so ridiculous yeah, it's, it's really, it's really bad. And just like now having like the healthcare, like the work that I do have, like being able to go to a dentist and walk out without pulling my, pulling out my debit card or credit card is, that's so wild. And it's like, why can't everyone have this? Like, there's no, there's no reason why, like this should be the standard. Absolutely. <laughs> totally agree. Cool. Well, great. I appreciate you sharing that experience with me. Very, uh, very enlightening. So I have uh, one final thing that I wanted to discuss. How has your intersections of marginalization influenced your experiences as a worker? So this could be anything from gender to uh, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, whatever it happens to be. But how has those intersections of marginalization influenced your experiences as a worker? I don't think it has to be honest okay um, that's fair yeah, like i'm coming i'm coming like maybe like there are things and i'm not realizing it but um i feel like the places i have worked have all had like pretty diverse teams and so like any intersectionality of like diversity that i have that i like would belong to any group there's nothing that like stands out specifically that affects me and that i mean that's kind of like obviously like a coming from a place of privilege right because like you know like i worked at kudo i wouldn't say that any part of my identity necessarily like impacted me as a worker there and same with like my current job like and then at zellers i was just a guy in a stock room yeah every place i've worked was like all diverse teams and so like i don't think like there was like anything that like i stood out for or anything like that cool. but i do think that my dad's experience probably has like influenced me more than my own 
personal experience. He has a thick accent. He has dark skin. He's tall. He's so like, you know, white people are scared of big, tall brown people, right? Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and you know, he's not afraid to to be argumentative. Like he's not afraid to like stand his ground. Right. Um, he was never anyone like the type of person to just kind of like take shit. He just Yeah. Like he he like demands like the same the same level of like respect that like all his other colleagues got. Southern Alberta, you know, I'm I'm sure we all know the stereotypes. Um yep. working in, in trades like he like he did, like it's definitely not a very progressive and friendly environment. Yeah, especially that employer specifically. They have anti coalition signs up on their digital billboard all the time. It's kind of funny because like the the owner that he worked with like he himself probably like treated my dad like fine like he treated him like any other workers but it was like the other people that he worked with right um that kind of saw issue with him being the person in charge of like maintenance and um, yeah but you know his his skin was darker than theirs and he got paid more and so that didn't flow with them yeah um he had he had an accent like he's traveled the world and he he likes to talk up Colombia because up here like in the, in the western world like the global south it's like shit on and shit talked sure. on and so yes yeah. so he, he tries to balance that out and you'd be surprised how how many uh people get offended when, when you try to do that and because he has a strong accent they probably assume he can't speak english well or he's not intelligent yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah and like like he is smart like he like he knows so much um about like s- such a wide variety of like topics especially like in terms of like agriculture in terms of like mechanics he's like tried to pass along all of that as much as that as possible to me but yeah working in those environments where they weren't great for for his like physical and mental health his experience definitely like influenced my like worldview as a worker more than my more more than my like personal experience like in terms of intersectional identities like obviously like my my experience is like is more class based instead of like identity based i'd say right yeah that totally makes sense okay cool yeah i appreciate you sharing that with me um any final thoughts for our listeners unionize your workplace <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> yes. be, find out how much everyone makes tell everyone totally. like slowly like leak it out find t- tell people you know make make weight transparency a thing yeah make, totally. make, them, make, make them aware of of how badly they're getting screwed over by management and, and take back power. Nice. Where can people follow you and your work? Do you have a website, social, newsletter, podcast, whatever? I just have my my Twitter at the Juan Estevez. That's about it. I don't have any. That's totally fine. Yeah, I'll yeah. just make sh- I'll make sure to put it in the uh, in the show notes as well, so people can follow you on Twitter if they're if they're interested in seeing what you have to chat about. All right. And if people are interested in following the Alberta worker, you can find us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We can also visit our website at albertaworker.ca. We also have a daily, weekly, and monthly newsletter, which is basically a summary of the most recent news stories that we've published. Please, if you like this podcast, rate it and review it in your favorite podcast app. We appreciate the support of listeners like you. Our financial support is 100% from our readers and our listeners to the podcast. We have no corporate subsidies. We have no ads. We have no paywalls. We appreciate the generosity of of your donations. And so if you can, I know things are difficult financially right now for a lot of people, but if you're able, please consider becoming a a monthly supporter to the Alberta Worker. If you're interested in being a guest on the Alberta Worker podcast, just email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca. Or you can send us a DM on one of our social media accounts. Thank you, Juan, for being a guest today. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. And as always, solidarity. Solidarity. Thank you, Kim.